This is Agriculture Today, and I'm Shelby Varner with the K-State Radio Network. Beginning today's show is Kansas Animal Health Commissioner Justin Smith with information producers should keep in mind related to the West Nile virus and biosecurity. K-State's Bob Larson, Ted Schroeder, and Audrey Marchek continue the show by reviewing the new CAFDEX app. They work to create a resource that is hopefully beneficial for many cattle producers. Completing today's show is K-State Dairy Specialist Mike Brook as he discusses research from University of Minnesota Extension on the causes and prevention of beef calf scours. That and more is coming up ahead on Agriculture Today. tuned in to agriculture today and we start our tuesday show discussing a virus that you might be seeing in kansas but then also thinking about biosecurity and then to talk about it we have kansas animal health commissioner justin smith justin thanks for joining us today well thank you shelby appreciate being here and justin wanting to talk about west nile virus and kind of what is this virus yeah, no, this is a virus uh, that we see uh, during our summer months. Uh, it's a virus that our mosquito population has a tendency to be a carrier of and, and be populated with it. We see it be a problem different years. Uh, this just happens to be one of those years that it's popping up and, and we're seeing some impact from it. I hear about it when we talk about humans, but also a concern when we think about livestock. That is correct. So from our livestock component, our horses are the ones at risk right now. And so we are seeing some horse cases in the state. Uh, we usually have two to three. Uh, we've actually had nine positive cases that we know of here in the state uh, so far this summer, uh, with September being our, our key month, being our peak month, usually historically. And in a few different counties, not really located just in one part of the state either. That is correct. Uh, It tends to be localized in our central part of our state. So we've seen it uh, across the the central portions. But we've seen some cases in Ford County and we've seen some cases in Douglas County as well. Justin, you mentioned horses. So is that really the only species of livestock we're concerned about or should really all of the livestock be concerned? Horses are the ones of our concern. So they are the ones that that can see the, the negative aspects of this virus. And what does it present as in the livestock? So typically the horse may not show, I mean, frankly, it may not show any signs at all. But when it does flare up, we'll see those those symptoms of a viral disease, namely a fever, inappetence, dullness, fatigue in that respect. But at the same time, it can go into a neurological component. So we will actually see some ataxia or, or incoordination in the hind limbs and may actually go down and, and can be a fatal disease in our horse populations. Is this quickly onset or kind of take a while to enact? Typically, the horses that, uh, that show that neurological component is, hey, we don't know exactly when they got bit, but at the same time, once they get viremic and it goes into the nervous system, it progresses pretty fast. Uh, and would highly recommend that if you're seeing any kind of symptoms like that, that you get with your local veterinarian as quickly as you can. Are there a few things that producers could do to hopefully reduce the chances of their horse getting this virus? And if so, what are those few things? Most definitely. So the key thing is, is what we have a vaccination. We have a vaccination in the equine world, and it's, and it's very effective. And so I would highly recommend that the uh, horse owners get their horses vaccinated, keep them up to date. You know, most of the time, horses that are vaccinated, we're not seeing any issues with. Uh, most of the horses that we've had affected have been unvaccinated horses or not vaccination, current vaccinations. And so is that a yearly vaccination? That is correct, yes. And so just taking the time to get your veterinarian yep. and putting together that game plan? That is exactly right. If this horse has West Nile virus, can it be given to the humans or other horses that they're stalled with? No, not directly. Not directly at all. So it does take the mosquito vector. The mosquitoes actually get it from our bird population. So we know that our our wild birds have the virus and can be the carrier of the virus. They go bite that bird and come over and bite either a human or, or a horse at that point in time. And so it's not a direct connection. And Justin, you're with the Kansas Department of Agriculture and The West Nile virus is a reportable disease. And so, Justin, what does being a reportable disease mean and how does that factor in for the Kansas Department of Agriculture? So, yes, it is a reportable disease in the state of Kansas. What we would ask is if you have knowledge that your your horse uh, has 
West Nile virus, either through your veterinarian or through your diagnostic lab, is that you give us a call. Uh, let us know. We're going to ask you a couple questions of, about where are you located, how old is the horse, is the horse vaccinated, and then, frankly, how is the horse doing is what we want to know. So there's no regulatory action taken. It's just more of an information so that we can make sure that we get people uh, uh, educated and aware Justin, you mentioned birds, and so you kind of want to talk about something that's happening on the East Coast and thinking about biosecurity. So, yeah, I mean, a, a great opportunity when we do talk about birds, about all of the biosecurity and the issues going on. And so, as many of you know, we've, we've struggled with high path avian influenza in the nation and, and, frankly, here in Kansas the last couple of years. Just want to make sure people are aware that we're getting back into our migratory season, that birds are starting to migrate, and that we've had a couple cases on the East Coast that have already popped up with, with HPA. AI or high path avian influenza already this season. So just again, use all those practices that you put in place in the past and make sure that, that we keep our poultry flocks safe. And for people who are new poultry owners, what are a few of those key points that you want them to do? Well, the key point is, is just make sure that we maintain that separation from our wild flock. So if, if you have a pond or if you have the place that the wild birds are congregating, make sure that we keep some sort level of separation, that you keep your birds, frankly, under cover or into in a coop. But if you happen to go in and, and you're, you know, you're dealing with your flock and you're dealing with uh, doing the chores, make sure that you clean your boots or change your boots, that you're not tracking anything in. And that, you know, if you're going to go to an exhibition or to a show, we just finished up with the state fair, you know, practice good biosecurity when you go home. Clean your instruments, clean your pans, clean your cages, but make sure and isolate those birds so that, you know, if there happened to be something at something of those, that you're not carrying it back to your flock. And speaking of the state fair, a lot of species there and not just the birds. And so what's a reminder maybe to all producers or all showers who are there taking care of their livestock? Basically, is that is just be aware of what's going on at the show, or that if you you hear some things, it might be. But just assume that there's something there that that might impact your flock or your your herd at home. And if that's the case, go home and isolate those those animals. You know, put them in a spot that they that they they've got some separation from your normal flock or your normal herd. Do those chores last, and then just keep an extra eye on them. But if you can do that for ten days, a couple weeks, uh, most of our bugs are going to be fine. And Justin, where can people find out more information about this virus or biosecurity? Sure. So we'd ask them to come to our, our website at uh, www.agriculture.ks.gov. But yeah, come to our website and we we have some pages there that definitely uh, will help guide on the biosecurity component. Justin, I appreciate you taking the time to join us today and share with us some relevant information. I appreciate it. Thank you for the time. That was Kansas Animal Health Commissioner Justin Smith with the Kansas Department of Agriculture, and he was discussing West Nile virus and things people need to keep in mind when it comes to biosecurity. You can learn more about the virus and biosecurity by going to the KDA's website at agriculture.ks.gov. I will link that in today's show notes, which you can find on agtoday.net. We're now going to be joined with Amelia Schatz from the Kansas Wheat Commission with a wheat scoop. Kansas Wheat produces are in the beginning stages of planting winter wheat, and as of September 10th, 4% is complete. As the calendar flips over to September and more seasonal fall temperatures are in the forecast, it is time to start planting wheat. As planting kicks off, producers and researchers alike are cautiously optimistic about next year's harvest potential. Winter wheat planting in Kansas was at 4% complete for the week ending September 10th, 2023, according to the official statistics provided by the USDA's National Agricultural Statistics Service in its weekly crop progress report. That pace is near 3% for last year and the five-year average. We were well behind last year, said Brian Lennon, Kansas wheat commissioner who farms near Goodland. Planting season was way behind and then everything came up. Harvest was really late, so we were starting harvest around the time we would have normally finished. Lennon started planting wheat on Tuesday in northwest Kansas. His ground received just a few hundredths to a short quarter inch of rain over the past week, but he reported even where the ground is dry on top, there is moisture further down. Moisture, received or expected, impacts where and when producers will start to plant wheat, with some waiting for that September shower and others waiting to dust it in if there is the potential for rain in the forecast. Having that moisture available to get the wheat stand established is critical to the success of next year's harvest, according to Brian Olson, head of K-State's Western Kansas Research Extension Centers. Olson pointed to research being conducted by K-State at Tribune, Garden City, and Hayes on the benefits and trade-offs of occasional tillage, about one pass every three or four years to try and control problematic weeds. 
Lennon noted his operation has had to make many adjustments during the past three years of drought, explaining they mixed up their management practices to include light tillage, chemical applications, and other practices to address different concerns in different fields. He also has been growing organic wheat, meaning he must think even more creatively about addressing those concerns. In turn, however, those solutions bring management ideas back to the conventional side of his farm. Managing wheat fields for weeds and disease benefits not only next year's yields, but also other crops in rotation. Wheat is a foundation for farmers to plant their summer crops into, Olson said. I'm a firm believer that wheat is the basis, and when there's good wheat residue out there, we have a good chance of raising the summer crop that next year. That rings true for Lennon's operation in northwest Kansas, who also noted wheat's value in the overall crop rotation. Overall, as Lennon and fellow Kansas wheat producers fire up their tractors to plant wheat, he is excited and optimistic about the upcoming growing season. I just hope everybody has good conditions and gets a good stand and a good start to this year's crop, Lennon said. Wheat is a good crop for us, and it really fits our rotation and our program well, and I wish the best of luck to everybody else. For the latest in K-State's planting recommendations during the current year's conditions, visit eupdate.agronomy.ksu.edu. Producers can also access the latest resources for variety selection and performance data information from k-state at kswheat.com slash wheatrx. With Kansas Wheat, I'm Amelia Schatz. Once again, that was Amelia Schatz with the Kansas Wheat Commission with a wheat scoop. As of September 10th, 4% of planting winter wheat is complete, which is slightly behind the five-year average. You can learn more from Kansas Wheat by going to their website at kswheat.com. Again, that is kswheat.com. I will leave it linked in today's show notes, which you can find on acttoday.net. We're cutting to a short break now on agriculture today, but when we come back, will be joined by K-State veterinarian Bob Larson, K-State livestock economist Ted Schroeder, and K-State master student in agricultural economics Audrey Marchek as they discuss a new app called Caftex. tuned back in to Agriculture Today, and we continue our show now discussing a new app for cattle producers. And then to talk about this app, we have Key State veterinarian Bob Larson, Key State livestock economist Ted Schroeder, and his master's student in agricultural economics, Audrey Marchek. Ted, getting started with you and discussing kind of how this app came about and how it got funded. So especially Dr. Larson and I, we're, we're spending some time thinking about, you know, ways that we can provide tools that the industry can use and the beef industry and cattle and producers can use to enhance decision making. And one of the ideas that we've long seen as a challenge in the industry is not only collection of information within operations that enhances decision making, but also the ability to transfer some of that information to downstream customers, say, to a cow-calf producer selling to a background or to a feedlot or and or retaining ownership, that we could easily, efficiently transfer selected information from the cow-calf producers downstream, ultimately maybe even further downstream from feedlots, further into uh, packers and, and even ultimately end customers. So that that this was a launch in, into a tool that would enable – quick and easy in the field data collection for very specific characteristics or attributes or treatments we were doing with these animals at the cow-calf level, specifically targeted with the calves in mind as the main uh, source of the information. So again, both meant to be a tool to enhance on-farm decision-making and data collection, really, that could interface with other kinds of, of uh, data management systems. Um, and this one is focused on a small set to be easy, convenient to use for what its intended purpose is, but also secondarily then to, to facilitate downline uh, or downstream data sharing. Funded by USDA, Federal State Marketing Improvement Program, and they have been instrumental in helping us, you know, sort of get this is really a pilot kind of project. So get this thing launched. See the see the potential for use on farm and enhancing cow calf decision making. But just how would it work, and how could it work also as a data sharing instrument? 
And Bob, as a veterinarian, what all does this app collect for cattle producers? Yeah, so we noticed a few things, and some of our earlier grad students found that you know, the most common data collection method that, that a lot of cow-calf operations use is just a, a written, often in a, a pocket notebook or something like that. And there's some advantages of that. It's cheap. It's low-tech. You don't have to worry about Wi-Fi connections or anything like that. But there are some challenges, too. Losing the data, maintaining data from one year to the next, and transferring that data, as Ted said. All of those don't work very well with just kind of handwritten records. And we thought that because almost all beef producers have a smartphone that could collect data, that kind of marrying those two ideas, something that's a relatively simple data collection form similar to a pocket notebook, but that has the advantages of being digital so that you can transfer it from one person to the next. Uh, you can keep multiple years of data collected. So there's just some advantages of trying to kind of mimic that pocket notebook, but the advantages of digital information. Audrey, you're a master's student here at K-State and have helped make this app possible and as someone who has used this app in their own life. Yes, that's correct. So I'm actually originally from a mid-sized commercial cow-calf operation in Eastern Oregon, did my undergraduate degree here in animal sciences at K-State, and then transitioned into the agricultural economics program. So it's really been interesting to see the use of this app firsthand from a transition perspective as Many producers have. We've previously used paper records as well, and it's really been interesting to see from that transition point, as I personally have found it quite useful from tracking inventory of our cattle, whether that be through treatments and processing procedures when running your animals through the chute, to out in the field data recording features such as entering when a certain cow has a certain calf, and you can just enter that specific identification and what treatment procedures that that calf underwent right there out in the field. Another feature that we're really trying to promote with this app is that you can utilize it and save save data within the app itself while a user is out of service because that's a common issue that we run into, especially in rural areas and particularly something that we have struggled with being from rural Oregon is that sometimes access to cell phone service or a wireless network is not the greatest. So we want to make sure the functions within the app have that capability that producers are able to use it regardless of where they might be on their operation. And one thing I really want to make sure we do touch on is that you don't need cell phone service to have this app work. And so if you're in the middle of a field or at a location where there is no cell phone service, this app is still going to be working? Correct. And there's a sort of two facets to this. So um, when you're initially entering your data, there is a save function within the app. So long as a user presses save, they are able to come back to that data later. It should all be there available for them in the app. And for the information sharing function, so say a user wants to... Um, have access to their data either on their home computer or in a spreadsheet. That is the case where you would need a Wi-Fi connection or cellular network to use to utilize that export data function. And then from there, it should be able to pop up with whatever email that the user um, registered their account on and should be available here in their account and to use and edit that data accordingly as desired. And so who do you recommend take the time to download this app and use it? So we, we've had a variety of folks already, even with just a very recent launch of the app and, and really having it in a public domain, we've had a fair number already download and, and start to sort of test and, and explore how the app can be used in their operation. It really does fit anything from a very small operation where you know, you, you have just a few animals and, and Audrey and I have even talked about, you know, even a 4-H type calf thing to help a, a young budding beef producer uh, learn how to how to record and, and store data to larger operations. And we, we have the ability, uh, an important point here, and I want to note that if someone has, say, you know, 500 cows or something and they want to enter all those cow tag data into the app quickly so then they can later populate the calves as they're born with those. Uh, we can do that. We can facilitate a dump if we have those data. It helps if we have an electronic format, but we can even input them fairly quickly. So we can facilitate sort of the launch by easily populating the app right away with the with the cow herd of that particular producer. The app is also set up so that if you're, if you're a producer who has, say, several herds that you keep separate for some reason, they may be different breeds or different geography of where they're at, the app is set up so you can set up different herds and keep them separate in the app itself. And, and depending on which herd you're managing that day is the one you would then access data for. So a lot of things like that that are meant to really facilitate 
small user uh, operation users as well as larger operations. And one other point I want to add to what Audrey said, you know, the, the really valuable component of this app that you can enter data out in the field as calves are being processed, you're out there, you know, calves that are recently born, enter whatever treatments and whatever protocols you've done to them that day. Is it also then when you get back to the home base, say, where you where you turn on and, and upload those data to a, to the spreadsheet, to an online system, those data then are data you can access, summarize, use for future analyses and decision making, as well as share downstream. So the whole idea of making it easy to input and efficient then to utilize analyze, merge with other on-farm data, and share is, is what this is all about. And Bob, from an animal health aspect, how do you see this being important to producers? Well, I think both producers and veterinarians really appreciate being able to go back in time and identify animals that got sick, uh, what treatments were used, because we think our memory is going to be pretty good, but I know mine is not. And so, again, some of the medical record keeping is, is really enhanced you know, in a fairly simple manner through this app. For this app, kind of what does it look like and where can people get it? So the app is currently available on both iOS devices, so anything that on the Apple Store to as well as the Google Play Store. Um, I recently made the recently made the transition from Apple to Samsung, and it was a pretty easy transition um, going for both of those. And that I was quite pleased that I was able to access my account, still have all of the same data available when logging in on both types of, of devices. And that was one of our primary um, objectives when developing the app was that we wanted to create something that is ultimately user-friendly, um, not super intimidating to learn, and to get it out into the hands of producers. And Audrey, is this a cost for producers to use? Um, no, there is no cost for producers to use at this time. The app is free and available for download on both the Apple Store and Google Play Store. Ted, Bob, Audrey, I appreciate you all taking the time to join us today and sharing with us about a new app called Caftex. Our pleasure. We appreciate the opportunity. That was K-State Master Student in the Department of Agricultural Economics, Audrey Marchek, and she was joined by her advisor and K-State Livestock Economist, Ted Schroeder. They were also then joined by Kansas State University veterinarian, Bob Larson. They were all discussing a new app called CAFDEX, which is spelled C-A-L-F-D-E-X. You can find it in the Google Play Store or App Store on your cell phone. I will also provide a link to it in today's show notes on actoday.com. Also in the show notes will be a news release discussing this app if producers would like to read more information. The app in your Play Store or App Store is purple with half of a cow's face outlined on the left-hand side in an ear tag. Within the bottom right-hand corner says Calf Dex. We're cutting to a short break now on Agriculture Today, but when we come back, we'll be joined by Mike Brook for this week's Milk Lines. Listening to Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network. Along with Shelby Varner, I'm Jeff Wickman. We end today's program with this week's milk lines. Calf scours can be a major problem for cow-calf operations. However, controlling the disease is complex because there are so many variables. University of Minnesota Extension has been researching the causes and prevention of beef calf scours. This week, K-State Dairy Specialist Mike Brook discusses some of their research and explains how Kansas dairy producers can benefit from the findings and recommendations. Today, I'd like to visit with our Kansas dairy farmers concerning scours in your dairy calves. It's been a recent article that appeared in Hordes Dairymen based on some data provided by the University of Minnesota Extension on maybe a treatment program as you look at scours on your dairy. You know, we generally have a high percentage of our dairy calves. Sometime in the first four weeks of life, they will develop scours. And, you know, a lot of times our treatment program for that probably doesn't really hit the target quite as well as it should. So I encourage you to listen on for the next couple of minutes, but then also take some time to visit with your herd veterinarian and maybe visit about what you're doing to treat scours in your younger calves. So as you look at scours in these types of calves that are less than four weeks of age, 
The most common causes of scours are actually crypto, rotavirus, or coronavirus. So when you think about this, if antibiotics are part of the treatment program that you're depending on, may not be very effective considering that crypto is actually a parasite and the other two are obviously viruses. So what are some things that you should really be keying in on as you treat these young animals? Well, number one is actually supportive care. A lot of these animals become dehydrated and become dehydrated very quickly. So getting them rehydrated is a huge part of that. So that may include some cases IV treatment. It may include providing uh, some esophageal feeder and then uh, some additional electrolytes as well. One of the things that is often omitted in our programs is actually the milk that they would normally receive. So visit with your herd veterinarian. They still need calories. Even though they may be dehydrated, we need to treat for that. But we also need to provide them with nutrition, and that would be the milk that you would normally feed. Second thing you need to think about is pain medication. Many times these types of uh, viruses or the parasite, the animal's actually fairly painful. So your goal is to try to get them back on feed. So obviously, if you're in pain, you probably don't go to the feed bunk yourself. And well, the calves are the same way. So pain medication is really something that you need to uh, discuss with your herd veterinarian because that's very important in trying to get them back on feed very soon. And then the third main point that uh, we'd really like to make uh, with our producers is that you never take the milk away. They still need the calories. Even though you may be doing other things for them, they still need the calories and the protein that they get from the milk that uh, you're feeding uh, twice a day or more often, depending on what the case may be. So don't take that away from them. Again, visit with your veterinarian as to how you need to uh, administer this in relationship to the other treatments that you're doing. Some of the electrolyte treatments, we do need to separate those from milk feedings, particularly those that we may be giving by an esophageal feeder or if the animal will actually uh, drink, giving it through a bottle. But we still need to separate the feeding of the electrolytes from the milk feeding. Generally, about uh, 30 minutes is enough to uh, provide adequate time between those two feedings. So as you think about uh, your calves and uh, what you're doing to treat uh, scours, if you want to be more effective in getting these animals to uh, recover very quickly, you might want to consider some of the points that I shared uh, today. Again, you need to uh, visit with your herd veterinarian, and uh, you might uh, look back in your Hordes Dairyman editions and uh, find the article that I just referenced. You can also find it online. And uh, that might be an important starting point for the discussion with your herd veterinarian. This is Mike Brook with K-State Research and Extension. Thanks, Mike. And that'll do it for this edition of Agriculture Today. For Shelby Varner, I'm Jeff Wickman. This is the K-State Radio Network.